This segment is on digestive physiology. There are two ways to look at digestive physiology. The first way is to look at each part of the digestive system and determine what happens at each location. The second way is to look at the macromolecule that is to be digested and follow it all the way from the mouth to where it gets absorbed into the body. I'll start by just summarizing what happens at each location of the digestive system and then in a different segment I'll talk about the individual digestion of the macromolecules. We want to concentrate on two things. What digestive products are released at each area to aid in digestion and what gets absorbed at each area. The mouth, of course, is where it all begins. Food is brought into the mouth and is mechanically processed by the teeth. The salivary glands release saliva that will begin the chemical digestion of carbohydrates and lipids. Saliva contains mucus that coats the food and makes it slippery and enzymes which chemically digest the food. Salivary amylase is an enzyme that is secreted from the salivary glands and it begins breaking down carbohydrates. A small amount of lingual lipase is found in saliva and this will begin the breakdown of all lipids. Thus we begin the chemical digestion of carbohydrates and lipids in the mouth. At this point the pH of the saliva is about 4.0 and this is just the right pH to aid both the amylase and the lipase. The release of saliva is automatic and the command comes from the medulla oblongata whenever an object enters your mouth. The books say that no nutrients will be absorbed in the mouth and this holds true the majority of the time but we do know that some things are absorbed in the mouth. Some sources say a little glucose gets absorbed in the mouth and some vitamins are administered as drops under the tongue to get absorbed. But for our sake we'll just say that no nutrients are absorbed in the mouth. We do know that some drugs get absorbed in the mouth as well like nitroglycerin. The food is called a bolus as it leaves the mouth and enters into the esophagus. Once in the esophagus it travels down to the stomach through peristaltic contractions. No absorption of nutrients occurs in the esophagus but the digestion by the salivary amylase and the lingual lipase will continue. Once the bolus hits the stomach it is greeted by acids and enzymes that will chemically digest it even further. Within the stomach are microscopic gastric pits that contain mucus cells lining the sides of the pit. The mucus cells will secrete a mucus to help coat the lining of the stomach, helping to make it impermeable to water. Below the gastric pit are the gastric glands. These gastric glands are dominated by two different cells, parietal cells and chief cells. Together these cells secrete about 1.6 quarts or 1500 milliliters of gastric juice each day. Gastric juice contains mostly water, but also some enzymes. The parietal cells secrete intrinsic factor that is necessary for the intestines to absorb vitamin B12. The parietal cells also secrete hydrochloric acid that is very strong. It is such a strong acid that it would destroy the parietal cells, so instead the cells produce hydrogen and chloride ions, which will combine in the stomach to form HCl. The acid will bring the pH of the stomach down to 1.5 to 2.0. This acidic environment will stop the salivary amylase and the lingual lipase from continuing digestion. The acidity will kill most of the organisms that are ingested with the food. The chief cells are abundant near the base of the gastric gland. The chief cells produce a proenzyme called pepsinogen. The acid in the stomach will convert pepsinogen to pepsin, which is an enzyme that will break down proteins. Thus we begin the breakdown of proteins, or chemical digestion of proteins, in the stomach. Babies also have renin and gastric lipase produced in the stomach which are important in the digestion of milk. These are not produced in adults. In addition to the mucus and gastric juice, the stomach also secretes hormones called gastrin. Gastrin is produced by the G cells in the gastric pit and will stimulate both the parietal cells and the chief cells. Gastrin also stimulates contractions of the gastric wall and helps to mix the contents within. The D cells in the stomach release somatostatin, which will inhibit the release of gastrin. The stomach carries out only the initial digestion of proteins, and the salivary amylase and the lingual lipase will continue to work until the pH drops below 4.5. The pepsin activity will strongly increase as the pH drops to 2.0. There isn't any absorption of nutrients in the stomach for several reasons. The mucus coating the stomach lining prevents nutrients from getting across. 
The cells in the lining of the stomach are not able to transport nutrients across the stomach wall, even if they could get through the mucus. The stomach lining is impermeable to water, and the chemical digestion isn't complete. Some drugs can be absorbed in the stomach, however. Ethyl alcohol found in beverage alcohol can be absorbed in your stomach before any nutrients in a meal can reach the blood. A meal high in fat will slow the rate of alcohol being absorbed by the stomach because alcohol is lipid soluble and the fats from the meal will break it down before it is absorbed. Some drugs like aspirin will damage the epithelial lining and then cause gastric bleeding. The contents of the stomach are now a liquidy substance called chyme. The stomach will hold the contents and allow the gastric juices to mix and the pepsin to have more time to digest the proteins. Most of the digestion will take place as the chyme leaves the stomach and enters the small intestine. In the small intestine, the majority of digestion and absorption of nutrients will take place. Several accessory organs will aid in the further digestion of these macromolecules. The duodenum is the first portion of the small intestine. This area is a mixing bowl which receives the chyme from the stomach. The pancreas and the liver will both deposit secretions into the duodenum through small ducts. The pancreas will secrete a pancreatic juice that is a watery substance that contains several enzymes to break down the four macromolecules being ingested. Pancreatic amylase breaks down carbohydrates. Pancreatic lipase breaks down lipids. Nucleases break down nucleic acids from DNA and RNA and proteolytic enzymes such as proteases and peptidases will break apart the peptide bonds of proteins and polypeptides. These proteolytic enzymes account for 70 percent of the enzyme production of the pancreas. These enzymes are secreted from the pancreas as proenzymes and are inactive when they are secreted which helps to protect the wall of the pancreas. They become active once in the duodenum. The proenzymes secreted by the pancreas are trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, procarboxypeptidase, and proelastase. These proenzymes will become activated to chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, and elastase. You probably only need to know the activated form for this class. These enzymes attack the peptide bonds linking the amino acids together. It's important to keep in mind that large macromolecules need to be broken down into smaller molecules in order to be absorbed. Carbohydrates need to be broken down into monosaccharides. Lipids need to be broken down into monoglycerides and fatty acids. Proteins need to be broken down into amino acids. And nucleic acids need to be broken down into nucleotides. In these smaller units, they can be more readily absorbed across the epithelium of the digestive tract. So basically, the pancreas provides the enzymes required to break down all the macromolecules. The liver is another organ that secretes products into the duodenum through ducts. The liver is an incredibly important organ that carries out over 200 functions that can be categorized into three areas, metabolic regulation, hematological regulation, and bile production. Bile is synthesized by the liver and excreted into the lumen of the duodenum. Bile contains water, ions, bilirubin, which is a green pigment, cholesterol, and bile salts. Bile salts help to chemically digest lipids by breaking large lipid drops into tiny lipid droplets that can then be broken down further to triglycerides. This will be discussed in more detail in a different segment. The gallbladder will store the bile and will release it when the hormone CCK or cholecystokinin is released from the intestines. CCK causes the sphincter muscle of the gallbladder to open so that the stored bile can flow into the duodenum. The other functions of the liver will be discussed in a different segment. In the mucosa of the small intestine are a series of finger-like projections called the intestinal villi. These villi are covered with a simple columnar epithelium that is carpeted by microvilli. The villi and microvilli help to increase the surface area of the small intestine, which increases the total area for absorption by more than 600%. To gain perspective, this area is roughly the floor space of a spacious four-bedroom home. Inside the microvilli are capillaries and lacteals. The capillaries will carry absorbed nutrients to the hepatic portal system, 
which will deliver them to the liver. The liver will make adjustments to the amounts of nutrients in the blood before allowing the blood to enter the general circulation. The lacteals are lymphatic capillaries. Lacteals will transport materials that are too large to enter the blood capillaries. The intestines also have glands that will produce brush border enzymes. These brush border enzymes break down any materials that come in contact with the epithelial lining. Enteropeptidase is a brush border enzyme that activates the pancreatic proenzyme trypsinogen. These intestinal glands also secrete hormones called gastrin, cholecystokinin, and secretin. Remember that gastrin stimulates the parietal and chief cells to release their secretions, and CCK causes bile to be released from the gallbladder. Secretin is a hormone that causes the liver to secrete more bile. So, getting back to the duodenum, we have chyme that contains amylases, lipases, proteases, nucleases, and bile salts that are working to break down the major macromolecules. The chyme leaves the duodenum to enter the second portion of the small intestine called the jejunum. The chyme and all the digestive enzymes and substances will have plenty of time to digest the macromolecules as it travels through the eight feet of jejunum. And there is also plenty of time for the major absorption of the products of macromolecules broken down to be absorbed. So we can say that most of the digestion and absorption in the digestive system occurs in the jejunum. By the time the chyme gets to the ileum, which is the final segment of the small intestine, most of the chemical digestion and nutrient absorption has taken place. The chyme will continue through the ileum to get to the cecum of the large intestine by passing through the ileocecal valve. The cecum collects and stores material from the ileum and begins the process of compaction. The vermiform appendix is attached to the cecum. The appendix helps with the lymphoid system that is a component of the immune system. In the large intestine, or colon, less than 10% of nutrient absorption will take place. However, most of the reabsorption of water takes place in the large intestine. This will help to compact the material and form feces, which will then be eliminated in a bowel movement. In addition to removing water, the large intestine also absorbs a number of other substances. Bile salts and vitamins will be reabsorbed. Organic waste products such as urobilinogen and various toxins generated by bacteria will also be absorbed. Vitamins will be generated by the bacteria that reside in the colon. We call these bacteria normal flora because they are resident bacteria that benefit from living in our colon and do not cause harm to us, but rather help us in some ways. These bacteria will generate several vitamins during their metabolic processes. We can then absorb these vitamins into our body. The vitamins include vitamin K, biotin, and vitamin B5. Vitamin K is needed to make clotting factors. Biotin is needed for glucose metabolism, and vitamin B5, or pantothenic acid, is needed to make steroid hormones and neurotransmitters. In the colon, bilirubin is converted to urobilinogen and sterobilinogens. Some of the urobilinogens will be absorbed into the bloodstream and excreted in the urine, but the majority of the urobilinogens and sterobilinogens will be excreted in the feces. It is these two substances that give the feces a yellow-brown or brown color. Powerful peristaltic contractions will move material along the length of the colon toward the rectum. These movements should occur a few times a day and are triggered by the distension of the stomach. These contractions will force the feces into the usually empty rectum that then triggers the conscious urge to defecate. This is a reflex that is initiated by stretch receptors in the stomach. Babies and animals exhibit this reflex very well. They eat, their stomach gets distended, they have a bowel movement. They eat again, their stomach gets distended, they have a bowel movement. Adults don't always have such a good system and oftentimes will only have one bowel movement a day or even less. This is unhealthy, however, and allows more time for toxins and waste products to be absorbed into the body. Now it's your turn. Create a body diagram and list all the activities that will occur at each area of the digestive system.